Hey there, Internet friends. Trevor Starkey here with another episode of TV Thursday. This week, I wanted to look at House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. I've been with both of these shows since they launched in 2013, but as we enter their fifth season, my time to consume content as I've become more of a content creator has drastically reduced, and I haven't had a chance to really binge watch either of these shows like I had in the past. So for this episode, I decided to go ahead and look at the first episodes of each of their new seasons, which came out in the last few weeks or so. Potential spoiler warning for House of Cards or Orange is the New Black within. So first we have House of Cards with Frank and Claire Underwood on their road to election. When we last left off, a group of radical domestic terrorists had slit a man's throat and made a big public scene, and the president and first lady just kind of looked on with no remorse. Additionally, you had the journalist Tom Hammerschmidt taking advantage of their distraction with this terrorist situation and releasing his damning article about what the president had done to become the president and all the little machinations that he'd kind of put in place. And I definitely needed the recap video for this one because I had completely lost a lot of the thread on the subplots around House of Cards. So in an uncomfortable parallel to real life these days, you have the Underwoods really preying on the idea of fear and using it to rule kind of with an iron fist. You even have the episode kicking off with this very over-the-top political theater moment of Frank stopping by the House of Representatives to disrupt their proceedings and really insist that they, they declare war on ICO, which is the House of Cards equivalent of ISIS. And he's doing this all before he attends the funeral of the man they killed. Now the show's always kind of drawn a clear inspiration from the works of Shakespeare, most notably Richard III, but as Claire got more and more involved, you could see a Lady Macbeth kind of element to it as well. My frustration with the show has often centered around the idea that Richard III works because while Richard is a charming villain, he is ultimately a villain who gets his comeuppance, and so you get catharsis as the audience. And here we're four seasons in, into the fifth season, and Frank has continued to skate by mostly unscathed. Yes, he was shot in season four, but even that ended up working very advantageously for him politically as as people kind of sympathized with him and the country rallied around a, a president who had been shot. But what I notice most watching the show is that my lens through which I watch the show has changed, inevitably, given our current landscape. I now live in a world where I have to suffer daily through a woefully unprepared president who repeatedly denigrates the office with profound new levels of ineptitude, but he gets a pass because his party has spent the better part of the last decade shoring up their political clout through items like gerrymandering and choosing their party over country time and time again. So when I already have to see a shitty person in the White House day in and day out, I'm not inclined to escape into a world where I see again a shitty person in the White House. It leaves me disenfranchised and it seems that neither villain is going to get their comeuppance that they so richly deserve, so I'm left having to muster up the strength to even try and like sit through an episode of House of Cards. So there's every chance I won't actually stick it out this season. The world has changed. Frank Underwood is no longer as much of a boogie monster compared to the reality we find ourselves in. Orange is the new black, on the other hand. I had a much sharper recollection of how last season ended. You had the tragic death of Poussey and the overbearing inept replacement guards were the fuse that set off the time bomb that was the Litchfield women's prison riot. You had the season ending with a very iconic shot of Daya holding a loaded gun that one of the shittier guards had smuggled in but lost control of in the riot. And so this season kicks off right where the last season ended. Daya is still holding the gun as chaos screams all around her. She ends up firing off a warning shot to get everybody to shut the hell up so she can think things through and figure out what her plan of action is. The guard tries to humanize himself by telling this story about a frog, and then when Daya tells him to shut up, he starts saying it in Spanish to try and relate or connect, and she ends up shooting him in the leg. It's a very tense scene, because there's no telling what's going to happen, as you always run into when you introduce the idea of Chekhov's gun, where the gun gets introduced, so it's going to have to be used. And throughout the rest of the episode, it continues to invoke fear, because people are looking to Daya for for leadership because she's got the gun, but she's struggling with the severity of her situation, and oh my god, she just shot somebody. She shot a guard who could die if he bleeds out or something, and that's going to just completely fuck her life up. But even shooting the guard, and he lives, is going to completely fuck up her life. Elsewhere in the episode, you have the inmates really taking over the asylum 
or prison, rather, gathering the guards together as hostages. They're locking the doors so people can't get in from the outside, and they're holding up in areas like the commissary or the medicine cabinet, basically trying to kind of plant their flags for what could be the long haul of this riot. And enraged by the lack of justice for Pousset, Tasty and her group head over to Caputo's office and basically take him hostage and force him to record a, a more detailed apology video announcing who she was that they then hope to get out to the world and hope make go viral. They also introduced the idea to Caputo that the prison pretty much is under prisoner control at this point because he's been so disconnected. He heard the alarm going off but figured it was nothing, which just further shows the ineptitude of how the prison had been run, that the prison can be completely taken over and the head, the warden, doesn't even know it. Caputo's in an interesting situation because, for all we figure, he's probably going to get fired anyway for going off script at the end of last season. So when the women come to him and say, these are the things we want, these are our demands, he's kind of like, you know what, I hope you get them. I hope this is the spark that, that gets these changes that I've been trying to push for for you guys, but I've been blocked at every turn. Hopefully you get better results here, but, you know, riots never end well. So I think that's going to be the theme of the season is what do the women get from this, but also what does it cost them? And I think given the history of Litchfield, it's going to cost them much more dearly than any gains they will get in the long run. So I find myself much more interested and connected to the women of Litchfield and how they end up handling the riot than I am with the Underwood's happy terror time hour. So based on these episodes alone, Orange is the New Black is pretty much still in my things to watch list, whereas House of Cards is more of a if I get around to it. So those are my thoughts on some new episodes of House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. If you're a fan of either show, let me know what you think in the comments below. As always, I've been your host, Trevor Starkey from trevortrove.com. You can follow me at Snarky Starkey on Twitter. You can read more in-depth impressions of these episodes over at trevortrove.com and the link in the description below. And as always, from here at the Trove, treasure your friends.